Hello, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a black sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And we have with us the Queen of Thieves. <laughs> Hi there. Hannah New is with us, and we're so excited and so Aww. sad. Okay, yeah. before we start, before we start, everyone, we already did this in our podcast, but everyone, let's do it now that we have Hannah with us. Everyone, <laughs> raise a glass to Aww. Eleanor. Aww. To Eleanor Guthrie. To yeah. Eleanor Guthrie. Yes. Oh God, I can't the... start crying already. Jesus. No, 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 no. You're not allowed to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Or we say, and her unborn child. Good oh, God. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm the worst. I'm sorry. Gloriously oh, shameless. You said it yourself. Yeah, gloriously shameless. <laughs> Wait forward. Love it. All right. Yeah, you queen either laugh NASA. or cry, but yes, to the queen. Yeah. To the, queen. <laughs> to the queen. All right. So, Hannah, yeah, I don't even know where to start, except that I, I want to just say that was the perfect death. Yeah. It was beautiful. I really believe. And I wanted to hear what you think about Eleanor's death. I know I didn't really plan. We didn't know when yeah. we scheduled this. Right. But, uh, originally, because you were, you were nice and sneaky. I thought you might figure it out because I thought. I said, oh, maybe mid-season, that would be a better point. I said, oh, actually, I managed to kind of like sell that one without giving it away. You, you did beautifully because you said, yep. either, you said either episode six and ep or episode seven, and Tom said the same thing. Oh, right. Okay. I was yeah. like, oh, well, they probably just have really interesting things going on. No, it yeah. did not occur to me uh -uh. that they were going to kill Eleanor this early. Yeah. It really yeah. did not occur to me. Yeah, for yeah. me either. Mm. I mean, I, I think it came really at such a – kind of brilliant point in the season just because of the fact that you know for for the island to be in such jeopardy at this particular point and to lose Eleanor who's been striving for this island mm -hmm. you know for the past four seasons it just felt really right at this point and the writers were so incredible because they told me at the beginning of the season that it was part of you know that it was going to happen and so I knew that I was going to get these beautiful storylines and these beautiful moments of reconciliation. And, and as the scripts came through, I was just blown away by how they were building to it. And it was just, it just felt so right that all of the things that I've been playing for like, you know, for the past three seasons have been incorporated in, in such a subtle and like brilliant way without throwing it in the audience face at all. Yeah. It, it, they've just done it in such a genius way so there's so many little details in there which I'm sure you guys have picked up that I just you know th that just moved me so so incredibly deeply that I just mm -hmm. yeah I never expected it to be that impactful for me to be honest like it was it blew me away right. I wonder if I'll ever get the opportunity to play something as beautiful as that I mean <sighs> to grow to grow with a character for four years you know mm -hmm. and and for me, it was such a formative experience because I just left drama school when I when I got this role. Oh, wow. So, like wow. for me, it was like it was just like the death of the, the the death of the first role that really taught me what it is to be an actor. So, mm -hmm. wow, yeah, it was. And it you was, you grew so much as an actress over the oh, season. Yeah. It was a beautiful yeah. thing to behold, Hannah. It really was. Oh, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. So thank you. Gosh. Yeah. I and know. with a character that came off the page in a way that was difficult for me mm. personally, mm. Um, I think you probably heard a few episodes ago. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I said, <laughs> not knowing we were going to end up here, I said that <laughs> becoming my favorite character in this season, which I never would have anticipated. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people responded like that, which has been amazing. And I think that is just to the fact that we haven't seen much of her humanity yes to this point and yes. and i think that that was a really clever decision in lots of ways because it made you realize how deep the trauma goes for someone to yes. behave like that like yes. and it, there's something about it that makes you realize that anybody who's ever been horrible to you in your life or yes. that really that comes from such a pace of pain and mm -hmm. and that actually one of the biggest things we can all learn from that in, in a really beautiful way is that other people's suffering, it manifests itself in duplicitous, manipulative and violent ways. And I think mm. that we need to just remember that and understand, try and put ourselves in their shoes and say, where the fuck does this come from? Yeah. Right. Like, you know, 
and that's one way of of being able to just come out of it and try and see the humanity in any situation of conflict or any situation where we think someone is behaving deplorably so yeah it's it's about compassion and understanding and empathy and I think the writers have done it in a wonderful way and in a way that like kind of shocks the audience because they yes. didn't they never thought that they would ever feel anything for her uh-huh you know? so yeah it's uh clever well I happen to be one of those people who felt for her from the beginning but that's yes, true I definitely, <laughs> yeah. I, definitely, I definitely I definitely felt when with that beautiful death I, well there was a part of me that was like oh, I really I really kind of hope that all of the Eleanor haters like I hope you feel bad right now. I did. I did. I wanted them to feel yeah. a tiny bit bad. Because... <laughs> well, I mean, again, this is a show full of damaged souls. Yes. Mm-hmm. Some of them more than others. And some of mm-hmm. them got to have their vulnerability earlier in the storyline. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think there were moments that Eleanor had that throughout, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Yeah, I agree. I mean, I love how you. I think put it was very now. real that she never let it come to the forefront because mm-hmm. she yes. has, because she was so ego driven. Mm. You know, she was so determined. Her vision was something that was, that she thought would heal all of this trauma. You know, right. having this place as a functioning democracy, as a as a republic, as as a place that would be a safe haven that that her mother thought would was never going to happen. You know, for me, for me, it was just so poignant with that, you know, tiny little detail that the writers put in about the argument that her mother Mm -hmm. had. And I, it just, it worked for me so well as a memory, because I think there's so many moments from my childhood, definitely that I can look back on and, and, and go, that was a really, really significant moment. And I didn't know what it meant. Yes. Until I was much, 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 much older. Mm-hmm. And I held it there all that time. And, pa- and perhaps I actually misinterpreted it. And I think that Eleanor definitely misinterpreted what her mother said about this isn't a place, this is too cruel a place for a little girl. Mm-hmm. And she took it like, I'm going to show you, like, right. this isn't a cruel place for this. I'm going to be the girl that makes this a safe place. I'm going to be mm-hmm. the girl that you make sure that no more women die the way my mother died, you know? So that was something that I could play really, really honestly. Like I couldn't, I couldn't escape from that. Like it was, Mm -hmm. it was, it was so captivating to me. Um, So yeah, I think the writers have done it in such a clever, humane way. And to see someone have that moment of epiphany where they suddenly go, I've been fighting for the wrong thing my entire life was was just incredibly beautiful and then for her to die in that way was actually super symbolic because her, if her vision for the island isn't going to work nobody's visions for the island's going to work right. really <laughs> like, oh, come on yeah right i mean well, well we the know only this person that she, the only person that she trusts i think she 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 has this idea that 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 rogers could do something but i think with those little scenes with Flint. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before you start to realize that she thinks, oh, whatever happens in this situation, I'm out of here. And he's going to, he's going to hold on to the, you know, hold the reins. And yes. I don't think she feels so bad about that. I think she feels actually quite positive about the fact that Flint is someone that can be relied upon to mm. fight for the island. Right. I mean, the fact that he's prepared to give up the cash for the island is symbolic enough. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's something the writers put in in season one. Yes. You know, yes. when he get when he talks Absolutely. about Odysseus and the ore. Uh-huh. And- yeah, which is gorgeous. So, oh, that scene. Yes. I remember Absolutely playing. elevated the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember playing that and thinking, this is the catalyst for yes. everything she does from here on in. Right. No, and I love that the way she lights up when he says mm-hmm. that. Like you can just see Eleanor having this moment of saying, wow, this mm. is what I needed to hear. This was the yeah. thing that I didn't yeah. know I was waiting to hear. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely, definitely. And just that notion of peace, I think, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. she's just seen conflict her entire life and all she yes. can hope for is peace. 
Oh, and I think I'm even more heartbroken because she never got it. <laughs> well, she I, did I think it. anyway. She did. she did, I think, no, with the one lie from Flint. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay, fine. Fine. It's, it's one, one of the most beautiful okay, things she I've got ever a seen. A split As... second of peace. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. That I, I loved that so much. And the callback to um to when Eleanor was in the um the prison with Vane and mm. said, You can't you can't see what you took from me or why it was good. Yeah. And when Flint had that recognition that he could, that he could offer you a little bit of mm-hmm. peace in this moment. Mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. It was such an act of mercy for him. It was. God, and I think that's what she sees in him. She sees that despite all of the violent things he does, he's the one who has moments of mercy and moments of of coming outside himself. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh-huh. Or coming ways, outside of Flint, maybe. In his yeah, right. outside yeah. of his own ego in a way yeah. that it, you don't see in any of the other pirates, you know? Mm-hmm. I think... I think she kind of saw that with the vain flint dichotomy of vain being this representation of chaos in so many ways and mm-hmm. flint being this this image of order a man who was fighting for order in a world which gave him no legitimacy right. you know a man who who had a deep love for another woman who 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 gave him philosophy who gave him all of the things that made him reflect on what it is to kind of be human and, and, yes. and, and to fight for, for things that are bigger than yourself. And I think that she knows that deep down. And uh, the fact that he's the one to give her that moment of peace is just so symbolic of who yes. he is deep down, mm-hmm. despite all the nasty things he does. Well, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, he was in a lot of ways, the parent that she didn't get in her other mm. two dads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because if you look back at season, uh, at season one, uh, with the scene where she goes and picks him up in the bar and he's drunk mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. there's this, there's this kind of, um, strange attraction between the two of yeah. them. Yes. I remember. Yeah. We remember that very, we That's talked about so- that a lot forbidden in a way Mm -hmm. that's I mean that to me was just one of the most interesting things to play because on the page you didn't necessarily get that feeling but it Mm -hmm. it is that thing that she's in with all her daddy issues (laughs) I'm sure I'm sure Freud I'm sure Freud would have a lot to say about Uh (laughs) what was going on there but yeah it's it's he is her father figure in so yeah. many ways that forehead kiss was beautiful was that the right. first forehead kiss that, that we got yeah i think so <laughs> i think it was actually. i think it might have been it's so funny we yeah. spend so much time talking about rackham and bonnie and the forehead kisses the forehead but kiss. i think that was right. actually the first it's the original forehead kiss <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah there's a point where flint kisses miranda's forehead but i think that's later on yeah, yeah i think so no, and that forehead kiss is so perfect because because Eleanor at that point is. I mean, you, that we talked a lot about that. It was like what what was going on there. What what you know? Have you listened to any of the episodes? Yeah, I know. I love listening to it. It's, it's oh, thank you. It, yeah, <laughs> amazing. Wow. Okay. I mean, Luke put me on to it. Actually, I think it was as you guys started because he's amazing. He picks up on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then I started listening when I was in South Africa. So. Oh, wow. So you've been listening to us. Oh, so you, yeah. other than Luke and Toby, you're the only one who's really been listening to us, I think. It's interesting when you're working on the show and you're listening to people talking about previous seasons, it's actually really <laughs> amazingly helpful. Oh, wow. Because, because right. it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to kind of come out of yourself and see how the audience sees all the plots kind of interweaving. And right. Sure. F- you're so centered in, in your storylines and what you've got to do and and... You don't get time really to to think about the bigger picture. I mean, you try to, but it's just great having a resource like the podcast to listen to and go, <sighs> yes, that was, that's it. That's how it's going to, you know, that's why it makes sense. Oh my sense. God. Yeah. Hannah, that's so sweet. <laughs> this is You're so sweet. fan of you guys. <laughs> I, I had no idea you were listening to us this whole time. I just assumed everyone else was like, whatever podcast, I don't really do that thing. 
<laughs> wow. no, I, bet, I bet everyone secretly listens. Come on. I have no idea. <laughs> Come on. Well, I don't know. I hope I hope that Jessica does because I mean you've heard me talk about Max. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, but we talked about Eleanor Fleeling, and I mean, I think that was a moment Ooh, yeah. of desperation on her part. And I think that mm-hmm. had he made different choices, they probably would have ended up in some sort of horrible sexual entanglement that would have been horrible mm-hmm. for both would of them. Be, yeah. And he, he made that oh, choice yeah. because Eleanor was just so desperate, I think, at that point for anyone to, in the terminology that Liz always uses, to see her. Like Mm -hmm. that Eleanor really and, you know, we found out as time went on, even in the last few episodes, that even the people we thought that did care about Eleanor and did see her didn't, in fact. Um, And the people who did, I mean, I think Max is someone who really did. And Eleanor Mm -hmm. wasn't capable of of seeing that. Like, that's something we talked about a lot also, is that Eleanor had such a hard time understanding that people actually cared about her. Yeah. Yeah. I think she was driven by so much fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It was just terrifying to her to think that, that she could let herself completely confide or completely dedicate herself to someone. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, then the person that she does dedicate herself to, you see that she kind of dedicates herself to them in this yeah in this idealized vision of Mm -hmm. who they are Uh with Woods Rogers but really the relationship in so many ways I think was teaching her about humanity and self-sacrifice and love Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean um I can quote you okay (laughs) (laughs) um yeah I wanted to bring this up this in in uh in I believe it's the first episode of season four where she says, I contorted myself into this role Mm -hmm. and I mutilated myself so I would fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we discussed that as like Eleanor finding new sides of herself, but it's kind of sad. I mean, that's a sad thing to say at the same Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I think she's, she's angry that she's having to do that. She thinks she's worked so hard to be the person who she was. (laughs) Make everyone else know who she was, you know. <laughs> yep. But when she finally has to break it down, it's yeah, it is this moment of self sacrifice, and it's definitely this moment of kind of rebirth. The rea- you don't you don't get to see it, but obviously, I I spoke to John and Dan a lot about what actually happened in London mm-hmm. um, between, between seasons yes. two and three. Of course, you know she's been publicly humiliated. Mm-hmm. She has stared death in the face in a way that she has never before the stakes have always been high she's always Mm. had threats but she never all of those threats were nothing compared to the might of facing a court Mm -hmm. even though she Mm. even though to her there's no legitimacy in it you know and I get this sense that she was prepared to be a martyr to the cause of piracy totally prepared to be a martyr to it and and it was funny because we had these long conversations about how she would have, you know, totally pissed off her defense counsel. Because <laughs> she would have been of like, course. Yeah, I did that. And yeah, I did that. And I did this. And I did that. And like, shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> That's right. So, um, so yeah, I think she was she was prepared to be the poster girl of piracy. And I think the fact that she got a second chance was was something that you know she never anticipated and it was her moment of kind of surrendering to what the universe was presenting in front of her rather than trying to control it right and I think that that was a really interesting choice for me as an actor and and for me personally I think it teaches it taught me a lot about the reality of of just of acceptance and and a need not to control our destinies in in this kind of macro sense you know you've Mm -hmm. got to just deal with the here and now and fight with what you've got and I think I think she does that wonderfully and I think she as much as she has to step on other people in the process there is part of it that's like all of these mistakes and all of these errors have accumulated to this point for a reason and, and to me, it felt very, very poignant 
um, that she would not really know who her saviour was and that she would surrender to the fact that he was just her saviour. So, yeah, it was, it was an interesting choice and it was kind of a, a kind of a tough one because I, I mean, like I was actually, I, John and Dan know this and I've said it to them loads of times. Um, and I think I've said it in other interviews, so I don't think they'll be that bothered by me saying it, but mm-hmm. when they told me between seasons two and three that she would be taken back to Nassau by a man, I was like, hell no, oh. I can't do this to her. Like, how the hell can you do this to her? Like, she needs to shave her head and escape prison in London and be a stowaway back to Nassau. That's what she uh-huh. has to do. Uh-huh. This is my moment to be kick-ass and come on, like, you've got to uh-huh. do And they were like, no, she has to conform in a way. Right. She has to live with her lot. And it was, I think it was a much more intelligent choice by the writers than just writing her as this, like, kick-ass the way that I wanted to play. (laughs) So um, You were right. I think that we had to see her vulnerability at some point. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, I I started, there there were some moments that I started to see it with her relationship with Vane uh, in the prison, like I talked about, which is such a beautiful Mm. scene. And that guttural Mm. yell that you gave was gorgeous, Hannah. Um, (laughs) But... I, it was her relationship with Woods Rogers and that letting down of her guard that mm. allowed me to make enough space to have some trust, enough mm-hmm. trust to have empathy for her, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I think that you're absolutely right that 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 story that they crafted for her, while surprising, well, difficult to watch sometimes because we did. I don't want to say we lose some of who Eleanor was, but it was a pretty dramatic metamorphosis yeah. for her. Absolutely. And we're talking about the change in costuming into the corsets and right. and mm-hmm. that contortion of self. But but for all of that, the fact that her love for Woods Rogers was as close to pure as we have pretty much seen in oh, this show <laughs> made it a beautiful thing to behold. It really did. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. It's... Sorry, I'm very bitter about Woods Rogers. Liz, Liz, Liz has more compassion for him than I do. <laughs> Over the last couple of days, I was thinking, Jesus, I need to call Luke. I, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I've been there. I know what it's like after of course Vader. I was going to say, <laughs> so right, Wait, Hannah? If you do call Luke. Will you ask him to follow us on Twitter? Because we would really like to interview him. And I've asked yeah. him a few times. He just likes to mess with us on Twitter. He would be brilliant <laughs> on this show because his the way you should we see would his love script, to talk to him. Like his scripts are like full of scribbles. Like every single page mm-hmm. is just like it. There is so much in there. The, the amount of prep that he does, like it makes everybody like sit up and go, "Oh my goodness!" I mean, you've been playing a character for four years, and then uh, and then. So you've done all your prep at the beginning to know right. their backstory and stuff. And then you see someone come in and do that amount of work again. And you think, hold on a minute. Like, I need to go back and do all of that again as well. Right. <laughs> like, it just gets everybody's A game going up. And the amazing thing is, like, I, you know, when I watched the season back and I watched it, I actually watched it with um, Luke Arnold. Mm-hmm. Me and him went into the offices and drank a lot of beer and, <laughs> and watched the whole lot. Sounds like um, a great day. Yes. Yeah, we love it. We love it. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, and I think we got pizzas at one point. That was that was also yeah. exciting because we were just withering away at this point in a drunken mess, watching it and crying. Best um, life now. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, watching it back, and the first thing I said to Luke Arnold was, "What? Well, Jesus, Luke Roberts is dark. Yeah, yes. like he's evil. And like yeah. you see it on the page, but you just you don't kind of get the depths of his." of his uh, determination and the depths right. of his, his of his brutality i mean he's right. seen a lot of brutality with Rogers. i mean he's he's Obviously. especially when you talk about what happened to his brother and right. you know so he's seen so much of it but for her for me as i realized that i didn't see any of that when i was playing eleanor because right. i all i saw was eleanor's love for him oh, and you know wonderful. which yeah. is kind of I think makes it more powerful because mm-hmm. you watch it and you, and it validates all the other people who've loved Eleanor. It validates mm-hmm. the way they loved Eleanor. It validates the way Max loved Eleanor. It validates because all of them loved her for exactly who she was. And he 
loves her for the ideal of who she is too, I think. I think there's this a deep respect of for who she's for what she's achieved here. Mm-hmm. And I think she loves him for that kind of mutual respect of him of being a brilliant tactician. And, you know, so for me as an actor to look back on it and think, wow, hold on a minute, there was this whole other thing going on that I just didn't see at all in the process because I wasn't there seeing it happen right. and feeling it. I just read it on the page. So, yeah, Luke, Luke just, you know, kicked it he's out. He's killing it. That one. No, oh, he's, yeah, yes, he's, he's killing he's- it. It's yeah. true. I will start working on him to get you. Oh my God, that show. would be so great. We would love to talk to him. Awesome. I mean, yeah, awesome. I mean, I'm, I am super harsh on Woods Rogers um, yeah. in our, in our last episode. Cause yeah. I'm re- well, I was already really angry with him when we saw Havana. I was just like, holy shit. Holy like shit. this show's just taken us in a direction <laughs> I hadn't thought of. And then when I found out his plan, I was like, no way he's going to bring Spain to NASA has he not? I mean, come on. There's no way that Eleanor didn't tell him about the Rosario raids, right? There's yeah, just no, no way. way. Right. Mm-mm. Thank you. There's no way. And I'm just like, seriously, dude, you're going to do that to your wife because you thought she had a bad idea? You suck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> it, was, I mean, it was one, thing, it was one like... thing when he keelhauled my favorite character, but then <laughs> like, to bring yeah. Spain to to nasa is just the worst thing that was just the worst husband mood ever yeah i mean i mean signing a deal with the devil for fuck's yes. sake like i mean it's just exactly that's the reality of of the world uh, uh, of black sales yeah sure is that people Absolutely. have to sign deals with devils all the time mm-hmm. that's so true yes they do and <laughs> the fact that the the person who came in and caused the biggest upset in the his, you know, in Nassau, would then take it to the next level, <laughs> bringing right. the Spanish back. Is like, <laughs> so yeah, true. it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> no, story wise, it's amazing. I oh. just, am, I'm just really, really sad for Eleanor. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny because um, I, the the guys have just released uh, like kind of behind the scenes stuff yeah. of I don't know if you've seen it. It's like a, a short little promo about when they blew, blew the town up. Yes, and, I did yes. that. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it was just brilliant because Wolf Kruger, who does all our set design, is just brilliant. He is such a character. He's like, he's constantly, the, the, amount, the amount of hours this guy works mm-hmm. and to create this incredible oh, world. it's been amazing. And he's a genius. And he, he's so funny because he comes on set and he's so grumpy and he'd be like, why are you shooting that way? Like, built all this, shoot it the other way. Like, he's, you know. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course he does. He wants to protect his art. Yeah, naturally. The fact, the fact that he was so completely, you know, elated by the fact that he could blow it up. <laughs> just, to me, just spoke volumes about him and his and his talent and like mm-hmm. he. That's so cool. Yeah, there's something really, really beautifully symbolic about the fact that the genius behind all of it loved the fact that he could blow it up. And so... in the behind the scenes, Dan seemed quite giddy. I've got to say, what he's describing. <laughs> <laughs> he's a pyromaniac. He loves it. He loves blowing it up. That does not he surprise me it. at all. So wait, if we're talking about if we're talking about set design, I have a question about Eleanor's That's office. Right. Yeah. That like model house. What is that about? Mm. Do you know what that's about? It's actually a bird cage. <gasps> I thought it was a bird cage. Oh, oh yeah. shit. Oh my god. Which was, which was wow. such a that's brilliant so story. I mean, like wow. I spent when I first arrived on set, I I actually asked if I was allowed to stay on set overnight, which I wasn't because mm-hmm. because of insurance and stuff. I think oh, or sure. something, okay. something I like guess. that. They would have had to I pay mean, for security, I imagine, to be there uh, or something. They let they let Zach jump off of a horse. Why wouldn't they let you sleep? There? <laughs> I know. When it comes to stunt stuff, they're like, yeah, go for it. You're like, <laughs> um, I think we had like a month of prep um, where the boys were doing like boot camp and mm-hmm. being uh-huh. pirates and learning about rigging and stuff. And I just spent some time in her world, in her office and just absorbing this space and the things that they'd found and giving meaning to those objects in that, in that room. Yes. Mm-hmm. And obviously the chair has been so symbolic right. throughout the whole yes. thing. Yes. Yes, that's I'm not going to noticed. I have to say, I'm so glad you asked this question about the, the house, the, the birdcage, 
because to me that was one of the most intelligent amazing beautiful symbols that they could have put in there because you at the time there was also the cage of where right. Eleanor slept. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right, which so is so it, interesting. It just reinforces exactly, and there's never a bird in it. That's what I thought they yes. might put a bird right. in it, and they never put a bird in it. And to me, that was really symbolic. And I think, mm. I mean, for me, probably without revealing too much of my geeky backstory making stuff, but to me, it was her mother's bird cage. Oh, to me, that. it was... To me, it was something that she remembers so clearly of her mother loving. And, and, yes. and mm-hmm. so it was something that was always going to be there. And then the fact that she locked herself in a cage at night, you know, she carries the keys around with her all through mm-hmm. season one and two. Those are the yeah. keys to lock her and her jewels and her, you know, the loot that had come in that day that was, was deemed too valuable to put into the warehouse. She would mm-hmm. sleep with it. You know, oh, God. and this. Wow. The funny thing was though, because I totally like inside her cage, her sleeping cage. <laughs> <laughs> they put this stuff ferret. <laughs> what? Did they? What? <laughs> what the fuck do I do with this? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I make a backstory about a stuffed ferret? <laughs> so, like. The ferret was kind of an anomaly, but I just love the fact that she just, she just had it there. She just liked it. She just. I don't think I ever noticed that. A bit of taxidermy, why not? (laughs) Wow. So weird. That is so weird. Yeah. Yeah. And there was also a teapot that looked like an elephant. But I mean, I just. That I I saw. Yeah. Yeah, I I remember that. Those items to me were like the items that she just found curious that had come right. off ships and she just she loved that curiosity because to her it was oh sure that were the things from around the world that she was collating in this in yes. this hub of globalization wow. you know right because she had this connection to the whole world because of these ships but she never left mm. nasa no until she went to London. <laughs> right. Okay, fine. She went to London. But I mean, but I, I do love this whole idea. I think one of our listeners had tweeted something about mm. how before before episode six, one of our listeners tweeted something about, you know, Eleanor is probably going to die. There's just no way she's going to mm. survive because oh. because she's so bound to this island that there's no way sure. that the carnage could happen yeah. without Eleanor also becoming part of it because she's so Definitely. tied to the island. Definitely. Right. Oh, yeah, I God. think I think that that was that's see that's the kind of audience member that just blows my mind because mm-hmm. you have people who just pick up on this these meta narratives. Yes. Yeah. And they pick up on these they pick up on how important uh other elements of the production are. The island mm-hmm. is a character in itself. Absolutely. Yes. Cavern it is. is a character in itself. The brothel is a character in itself. Yes. Like Every single space that you see on screen is a character, in my wait, opinion. Wait. Okay, now we're just getting into all these. This is, I love that this interview is going in a million directions that I hadn't even thought of. <laughs> very, black, a very black sales experience. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, since we're talking about the tavern and Eleanor's mm-hmm. physical life, which mm-hmm. yeah, I, I did not plan on these questions, but now I'm okay, so in it because it. I love this. <laughs> The pouring of the drinks back into the pitchers. Yeah, that was one of my favorite moments, I think. Right. We t- there's more than one of that. And we talked about that. That was in season one, I think, the first time you see yeah. it. I mean, you see it really early on, maybe even in the second right. episode. And we were mm. talking about that. And I remember Liz saying, like, there's some aspect of this life where, like, Eleanor should just be running a tavern and not trying to do mm. all of this stuff. Like, that's, you mm. know, that's kind of like she's trying so hard and she's overwhelmed all the time. Yeah. But, like, this one moment of just, like, she, every morning just pouring. Is she, like, yeah. actually pouring the drinks back into the... into the? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, she has a whiff of it. And she has a whiff of it if it's rum. And it goes. Right. If one, it goes in another pot. Like, it's, like, it's it's simple. It's, I love that detail shit so about much. Backwash? Right. <laughs> Who cares? They're, they're like, pirates, she, whatever. She, she, exactly. They're all scummy. Um, <laughs> like, she's a pragmatist, you know? And right, she, exactly. And I think that that was what was really brilliant about that, about that little detail. 
that you see her being a businesswoman in the most mm -hmm. fundamental and yeah, kind of exactly but like, very she has no scruples. yes absolutely no i loved that touch i it, it's all the best I, business people do don't they <laughs> yes yes yeah no that that definitely gave more respect for eleanor that little touch yeah it was yeah. and uh, i th you know i loved it when people were really really grossed out by it too because i was just like come on the pirates like <laughs> right. they right. are gross like it was a nice opportunity it's like 80 proof rum yeah, yeah. i mean the wine right. is a little grosser but the rum uh... <laughs> whatever it's fine to rubbing alcohol. It's fine. i mean i'm sure the bacteria exactly. would have they're done their immune systems a great job exactly. fine <laughs> um, yeah and I think I think that was and it's also great that like um Scott's in that scene too and Hakeem yeah, exactly. obviously ha Hakeem and I have become like lifelong best buddies like he's oh, just such a wonderful wonderful man he is like this kind of mentor father figure to me too even though we're like best of mates and we hang out and you know and I and his family I'm very close to and so for me it was it was this wonderful scene of of their everyday life their everyday existence mm -hmm. things exactly. they have to do to keep the business running and you know whatever it takes <laughs> mm -hmm. no it's it was uh, yeah it's just one of yeah I mean mm. this is one of the gifts we've had of podcasting about the show is that we do you know when you have to talk about it you just mm. I may have exposed during the podcast that I watched the show many, 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 many <laughs> times many before times. we ever started the podcast <laughs> <laughs> I love but, it. But um no, but the podcasting does. It just forces mm. you to kind of see it differently and that's been super lovely. Mm. Um I wanted to go can I go back? I know we've gone in all these yeah. amazing directions. I want to go back to the death real quickly because there's something I sure. wanted to say about it that's like mm -hmm. my deep conviction about it that I don't think I said in our podcast about episode six. Um I really love, like, there were a lot of people, I'm sure you're aware because you're on social media, there were mm -hmm. a lot of people who were like, Eleanor must die because she did this <laughs> and she did that and she killed Vane and all this. I adore that her death is not about retribution. In a, right. yeah. in a season, yeah. like, John told us that, you know, that the unofficial theme of this season is love, which definitely works. Mm-hmm. The other, you know, I think the the competing the competing theme so far of season four is vengeance, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously motivating a lot of people all the time. Mm -hmm. I love that Eleanor didn't die for vengeance. I love that she died mm -hmm. for who she is and who mm -hmm. she became and her synthesis of 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 we have this whole thing about about child, you know we get people's backstories and their trauma. We did. It's right. funny. Eleanor's backstory. We didn't get in one piece like we did with Anne mm -hmm. Bonnie's mm -hmm. or, or Max. I mean, fl yeah. Or Max or Flint. I mean, Flint doesn't really count. Cause that was like a whole thing, but like, mm -hmm. you know, with Jack, with Max, with Anne, we kind of get mm -hmm. these moments that explain their motivations. Eleanor's whole existence is her, is in relation to her backstory. Mm -hmm. As far as what yeah. we're, what we experience, you get so many bits and pieces of it. And I love that the, death had to do with the backstory not yeah. with not with her actions because the male characters I mean not to get too gendery about the whole thing but the male characters do crappy things also right yeah. like we have a exactly. lot of characters who like we we understand why they're doing the horrible things and they believe that they're doing horrible things for good reasons I strongly believe that Eleanor always did horrible things for what she believed were good reasons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and I love that she didn't die for that as yes. much as the fandom was calling for it. I love yeah. that she died in relation to her backstory and her integration and not that. Yeah, I think that's and what... And boy, did she go up fighting. I'm so sorry oh, to have interrupted you. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, I, you know, I was, I was so honored when I read it because I was like, yeah, I mean, it just... Because for me, it's exactly that. Even the little details of how many weapons she has to use in, yes. in the fight. It's like she just grapples at anything she has. And that's so symbolic of what she does her entire life. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. always she been struggling. She grapples at what she has to hand and the situation that has been dealt to her. And she has to do it in manipulative and, and duplicitous ways. Yeah, because yeah. those are the skills. Those, those, that's what is available to her. Right. She's right. not a, she's not a warrior. She's not, mm -hmm. you know, right. she's not Anne Bonny. She is not Anne Bonny. She doesn't have that as her forte. And I think, right. 
But I think that was a very intelligent choice of the writers, as much as I was bugging them episode after episode. I'm like, there's still no swords. There's yep. still no swords. <laughs> you know what? So wait, I so even you went wanted to- swords and Jessica wanted a horse. That's, that's, that's where exactly, exactly. And you both, exactly. you and both got your it. thing. <laughs> we must have been really good girls throughout three seasons. <laughs> oh, and, yeah, and it's... Um, you know, I even I even went to the extent of going down to the guy who does all the armory and going, I think I need like a, a dagger or something that she just carries just for me, you know, just to <laughs> just to just feel to help you be has that security that she could use it if she had to. Right. And then I was gonna be like, Have you seen this beautiful dagger that they've made me? Like I wanna go <laughs> <laughs> I've got to use it. It's so great. And I'm not sure how much it costs, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and they designed it and it was beautiful, but I never got it, unfortunately, because the thing was they they designed it for it to be worn inside my boots. And then oh. I came back for season three and oh, I didn't no have boots. any boots. No. Any boots. Oh, killer. I know. I know. <laughs> Force it, but I think that probably would have done more damage to her than anything mm-hmm. else. But yeah, sorry to go off on a tangent again. But no, no, coming no, back to wonder, coming back to the death tangent. scene, and I think it's it's amazing actually <laughs> um, how the guys have worked in these much bigger themes in such a beautiful mm-hmm. way. And um, because I always said to said to them as well, like uh, for, for season two. For me, it was all about this battle between order and chaos. Like, right. where does mm-hmm. sure, where sure. does Eleanor align herself, and who does she think is going to come out on top? And I think, I think the kind of very clear message is that order, to a certain extent, has to triumph right. in order to reduce suffering. And I think that that's kind of what I what I take from from season two, and the mm-hmm. fact that then she's sent back to London to face the order of of, of Whitehall. Mm. Yeah, and and look civilization and look death in the face, Mm -hmm. like was was very symbolic for me. But the fact that like love and hate is uh, the overriding kind of binary notions that we're dealing with in this season is incredible, especially at this time. I mean, just Mm -hmm. what's going on right now and, and, the idea of retribution never basically keeping this cycle going. Like there's a point at which the cycle has to stop. And I think Eleanor says it uh, to Beringer. She goes to Beringer and she says, there is only so much fear a man can endure. And I think that that is Uh one of the most significant moments for Eleanor um, in this season as well, is that she really has realized that at a certain point, trying to rule with violence and anger mm. causes the breakdown of society and that this hate and retribution doesn't right. work. Right. We, we made a big deal of that because Max had made such a big deal when Eleanor was arrested of saying, well, mm. I'm not going to rule like her because, mm. because <clears throat> what is, uh, I'm usually really good at recalling lines, but yeah. right this moment I'm not, but she says basically like the powered perceived. That's what she says. That, right. Yes. Yeah, power yeah. least yeah. perceived is most effective or something right. like that and, yes. it, and, yes. and, and it was I was so excited for Eleanor that she finally learned that lesson you know mm. because again I've always had so much compassion for Eleanor I mean people who have spent their whole lives being rejected it's such a mm. it's such an I don't know if it's an appropriate response but it's such a common response to overcompensate with that yeah, through trying to show power and control mm-hmm I mean, the abandonment, I mean, it's like, it's, it's almost like Eleanor got a double dose. So she had the abandonment combined with just this sense, like that nobody really loved her for herself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so for me, the overcompensation that Eleanor shows always made sense to me. It always worked for me. I mean, even yeah. though sometimes I wanted to shake Eleanor for her actual actions, mm. the the motivation for them made so much sense to me all along, but it was so satisfying for me when she finally let go of that. Mm, yeah. I think the way they trickled it through all of the mm-hmm. season. Absolutely. And the fact that like the people who sat up and paid attention were the people who kind of saw what was going on there. And the fact that you, you made an interesting point earlier because you said, you know, other people got their moment of backstory. Mm-hmm. Other people got their, 
but there are moments where you could go, right, now I get this person, and now I exactly. get where they're driving to. Sure. Mm-hmm. And I think it was very clever that they didn't give that to Eleanor because she was this kind of um, – it's symbolic of who she didn't share that. You know, right, she right. doesn't know it. Exactly. She doesn't have it. Is it as oh, something that? That's a great point that she doesn't she know. Doesn't have, she doesn't no, have that so introspection, smart. right? Mm-hmm. No, she doesn't have the opportunity to. She's never had anybody mm. judge her in a way. I mean, she's uh, her father was. She was trying to get the approval from her father at a distance for a long time. She never got it until a few moments perhaps she started to see before his death that she might get it mm-hmm. Maybe. because she was brutally never, honest I, with him. Right. I never trusted him. <laughs> no. It's a piece of shit. Right? Like, come on. Thank like, you. <laughs> But I mean, that's the thing. And everyone's like, oh, but her father never cared for her anyway. Why does she care that he's dying? It's like, come on, guys. Like, right. however, shitty, however shitty your father or mother is to you, their dying isn't something that's satisfying to you you always live in the hope of someone of someone affirming who you are and what you do well and their death actually cuts off that ability like if she always wanted her father to affirm her and he's dead then that's Mm. it she's lost that ability Mm. yeah and maybe it was this moment of kind of i think that's what makes her so angry at vain is it's this moment of arrogance to think oh so now you're going to give me that validation Right, when you right. constantly do things which are in contrary to my objectives, like, mm. and you're so you're so concerned with how your crew view you, like, right. come on, you take you take 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 take, and yeah. no give, and like, I think that was it for her. She was just like, I know I will be bled dry by this. I will I will die at this man's mm. hands, and I think that's, you know, making that choice was incredibly difficult. And I don't think it came from a place of just vengeance for her father's death. It came mm-hmm. from a place of of survival that this guy will, he won't give me the validation that I ever, and he'll take all the other things that do give me validation away yes. from me. Mm. And it, particularly the fact that she's starting to see that Woods Rogers validates her. Right. And if he was to take away Woods Rogers as well, Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm not saying I agree with that as an action. I'm saying it's an understandable motive for somebody sure. who their entire life has had no affirmation from anyone mm. and just has lived with lived with with constant criticism. Right. You no, know? and that's a beautiful thing in Black Sails is that the characters feel so real mm. and you cannot agree with their choices, but understand them and have compassion Mm -hmm. for them despite that. And that's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a rare thing in storytelling. It's an amazing Mm -hmm. experience because we do, we are brought on these emotional rides that feel so true to life, even Mm -hmm. though they're, you know, fiction. Yeah. And being able to set something (laughs) in a completely different time period, but give it that Mm -hmm. universality, that kind of, exactly. The ability for me, that's why I love storytelling. That's why I'm an actor Mm -hmm. is because Mm -hmm. I feel like when you can represent something in art that that totally speaks to someone's experience of reality. Yes. You're getting there. (laughs) You're getting you're you're kind of doing what art has existed for forever. You know, since, since someone put a hand on a cave wall, the reason was because it was to speak to the experience their experience to other people it Mm -hmm. was to say i was here this was what we did this is how we lived this is it's validating yourself and it's validating the human experience i sound like i'm getting really waffly and no i'm philosophical with it all and like no no we're we're all good we're with you on this (laughs) (laughs) don't get self-conscious about this we are 100 percent there with you (laughs) yeah Everyone's going to be like, how are you so soppy compared to Eleanor? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no. You know what? That would not be a bad thing, first of all. Because as yeah. much as I love Eleanor as a character, I mean, seriously, would anyone want to be her? I don't want yeah, to be her. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no. I mean, you got to be her for a few years. <laughs> there's definitely things that I, uh, I admire about her. And mm-hmm. I think that have taught me things just to be a little bit more like, I don't give a shit sometimes, you know, right. yes. like just to have that ability Good to be you, a yeah. little bit more, um, 
the ambition I think was is is a mm-hmm. is a really amazing thing and and I hope that in so many ways you know to see someone from history who you never a female being a businesswoman in that way yeah right. like no, that's amazing I mean that for me was kind of a massive challenge at the beginning because I was like oh how are people going to believe this you look at the history and you look <laughs> at what's what right. women actually made it into the history books and you're like mm, there's not very many of them um mm. but then when you actually start to go into detail of things you start to realize actually hold on a minute there were so many women in this period who did things that were kind of antithetical to to the male hegemony of the time and so they never made it into the history books of course they wouldn't mm-hmm. um and i you know i was frustrated at the beginning because i was like oh my god i can't yeah. find anyone from history to like base her on and then i like think outside the box like piracy has existed not just in the bahamas it's existed all over the world since recorded history mm-hmm. and so like looking back, I was like, I found examples of Chinese pirates who led mm-hmm. fleets of eleven thousand pirates. You know, I've 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 read uh, stuff about Irish pirates like Grace mm-hmm. of Mali, and you know, who were aristocratic businesswomen who saw an opportunity and filled that gap and did it in wow. such a brilliant way that she pissed off Queen Elizabeth and ended up going to, <laughs> you know, on trial and was almost tried for treason because she had a knife in her boot, which is where the whole mm-hmm. knife in her boot idea came uh-huh. from with the armory. Oh, beautiful. And, uh, but she, wa- she managed to talk her way out of that situation. So I was like, take all those little bits and put it together and, and you'll mm-hmm. find Eleanor. And like, and, and, you know, even the businesswoman aspect of it was funny that you said, "Oh, she should she should just run a tavern." It was like, actually, I looked into a lot of the history of taverns in London, mm-hmm. and the majority of them were run by women. Right. Mm. You know, they were they were the fences. They were the people who, you know, kept the business running when soldiers and and naval men and were out at sea. So. They were the people who, behind the scenes, kept the business flowing, kept, you know, kept everybody's jobs alive, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, those were, like, interesting little elements that I could combine into into Eleanor. So, yeah, it's tough to research those things. But I think, you know, you realise that piracy has such an overarching effect throughout history and... And the fact that we're living in a globalized world now is because there were these people who went out and tried to create international trade and piracy existed to disrupt that. Yeah. You know, to, to me, sometimes it like blows my mind when I think about it because it's like they were mercenaries, but they were kind of anti-globalization at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right? They were stopping these empires from having too much power sure yeah yeah the whole thing is just it's so fascinating i mean it's funny i was not i had no before black sales i didn't really have any i wasn't like a pirate lover before that we have a lot of <laughs> listeners who are just like into pirates before yeah. before black sales but i was always actually really into queen elizabeth and so the whole mm. thing about privateers was really fascinating to me so it's it is such an interesting history because it mm. is like pirates existed long before Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. And yet she kind of leveraged that whole concept as something that she used for politics, mm-hmm. for global politics. It's such, I mean, it just, it really is just this really interesting part of the history of our world, like not just mm. of England, not just of the colonies. Like it's really yeah. fascinating how, you know, And piracy in general is a really interesting thing, or piracy in England, let's say, like, Mm. is an interesting example of something that a government creates for its own purposes or uses for its own purposes and then Mm. turns against it. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. becomes something which which is kind of a metaphor for for the colonies in general and, and the revolutions that came after. That the colonies were a tool of England and then became their own thing and rebelled. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like it could be kind of a little extrapolated, but I've been thinking about this in relation to everything that's kind of going on right now. And the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, c- colonialization was this 
you know, effort to become these superpowers. And the fact that we're dealing with a migration crisis now right, Absolutely. and a refugee crisis is exactly the, the same thing that an empire creates something to impose its power on other people, but Jesus is going to come back and bite you on the ass. Yep. Karma's mm. a bitch, huh? Like yeah. you're gonna, you're, <laughs> says, you're the gonna who, yeah. says the woman who played Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna make all these people suffer right. for your benefit, mm-hmm. and then you're not gonna then you're gonna give them nothing and expect right. think that they're not gonna come and and say fuck you, right? Like right, right. we live in this state because of what you did. Yeah. Like of of course, I mean, I think it's in human nature to fight for what what's your right and and to mm-hmm. to fight for the fact that when someone else has oppressed you that you have to fight back in that sense mm-hmm. the sense of equality with regards to to a situation where i mean i just to think what it must have been like to be a privateer and mm-hmm. then the next day be the enemy of the state yep like exactly. i mean the well, and all of the characters, all of the characters, I mean, that I remember John said that in our interview with him, like that the, mm-hmm. the one thing that's in common with all of the characters is that they've all basically been rejected. They've mm-hmm. all, they're all outsiders. Yeah. They've uh-huh. all had, and it's funny, like, I feel like in the beginning, that's been this kind of growing thing in Black Sails, like in the beginning, that was kind of in the periphery. Like we knew it, mm-hmm. obviously, because Flint so like Flint kind of was the first person who really made that something that was in the forefront of our mind of like what is going on with these characters. But you mm-hmm. learn little by little, each of these characters has this in common. Every mm-hmm. one of them is an outcast. Every one of them has a reason why civilization has has not given them given them a fair shake in life and has has mm-hmm. really put them in a position where being an outsider and and what but then what becomes interesting with about it like in all things with black sales that whatever commonalities characters have then you start seeing the differences and the differences is what becomes the most interesting and how each person deals with it i mean that's particularly interesting i think at the end where we are with our watching right now you've seen all of season four we have not but where we are with the where we are in season four is like this whole thing that max and Jack have this argument about whether they're whether you can fight from without or from within, mm. right? And that isn't that is also such a beautiful, beautiful scene. Oh my god, that scene! <gasps> oh. That scene is insane. Jessica, I mean <laughs> Jessica, in that scene just oh it god. comes from such a deep place. I yeah. mean, like you know, and I no, know no. her so well, and it's mm-hmm. just like to see that come out in such a truthful and and poignant way to me was just you know and it's two of them two of the greatest sparring you know? yeah beautiful it's so yeah. beautiful it's well, so yeah, talk beautiful to Toby so early on about those two characters mm-hmm. circling one another like cats mm-hmm. and it really came to fruition in that particular scene and to see them <laughs> like that was gorgeous were you yeah. guys just like yes Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. No, I was actually (laughs) yes. While that scene was going on, I was just freaking out. It was kind of Uh my dream come true, which scares me because whenever two characters interact and I and I'm excited about it, one of them always dies. (laughs) Yep. I have have a horrible, horrible, horrible track record. No, no spoilers because I don't know what's going on with those two. But Hannah does. Yes. Yes. Right. That's true. Please don't spoil. Please don't spoil. (laughs) We're not Um, trying not to have any expression at I know. All for this moment i know that's the danger of doing video chat with us huh is right? that you can't like, re- uh... react to what we say this is why they pay the big bucks yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah you need to, you need to channel yeah you, it's, just, it's, it's kind of amazing like yeah and I love I the build up to that scene as well. Oh, the little moment so on the beach before. Oh, oh no. Oh, amazing. The little really? hand gesture she makes. Yes. That, that yes. Just, oh my God. Blew my mind. Yeah. Yes. I know. And I, I just, know. I just love, I just love, uh, Rackham's impression of Max. Of like, <laughs> I know. I thought right. I would I'd at least get a sorry yeah. one. Sorry, Jack. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fuck no. I love it. I love I it. Jack, Jack, Jack Rackham. I know. Do, uh, oh, and then the, the I, oh, very I, last line, he's like, oh, yep, the Spanish are coming. You can right. stay if you like. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's fabulous. It no, was an listen, excellent Jack. I, I, I think that board. might have been improvised. I think. 
I'm not oh, sure. Oh, yeah. oh I see, I got I you got know, official so... confirmation of all improvised lines up until oh, now, but I haven't not? asked. Ab- oh. I haven't asked about season four actually. Mm. Almost all I... of the improvised lines up until season four were all were all Jack Rackham. <laughs> Oh yeah, like he does it. He does it so well, so brilliantly. Like it's just to work with him is like keeping you on your toes. I I was really kind of bummed. I didn't get more scenes with him. I was like, ah. I know, I know. Okay. No, and I actually talked in the last episode where I was like, I was saying that um, with the scene that you have with Zaytu, who says hello by the way. Zaytu oh, says bless hello. her. I love um, that girl. Oh my god, she's amazing. Um, so that scene that you have with Zaytu where like mm. Eleanor's trying to get the upper hand and then Zaytu's mm. like, I mean, sorry. And then Maddie's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Let whatever. Me just, like, let me tell you, let, let you, right. let me, mm-hmm. right. Let me tell you about my dad who didn't trust mm. you. And then, and then you, uh, Hannah, oh my God, <laughs> that thing where you go from Eleanor trying to be the badass, which she's, sometimes really good at and not always really good at mm. and then when you're just like oh fuck i'm so emotional now okay wait let me be the badass again and just like yeah. go yell at people yeah it was gorgeous that was so mm-hmm. beautiful for me i mean i said this in our podcast for me that encapsulated everything about eleanor that Aww. like my feelings are hurt therefore i will shut down and just be the like barking person mm-hmm. who tells everyone what to do yeah and I, and I even said in our podcast I was like I was really kind of sad when you go up to Flint and Rackham and you're that person because I was like I really <laughs> wanted Jack to see that other yeah. Eleanor for a second I mean not that it would have made a difference because you know Eleanor had killed yeah. Gaines, so no, there was no way anymore. there was mm-hmm. no way Rackham would ever have compassion for her but Rackham is such is so capable of, of compassion towards women but he never yeah. saw that Eleanor he never yes. saw the Eleanor no. that would move him no, no. And it was so funny because me and Toby have talked about it for like four, since season one, really. It was like, if anyone's going to kill Eleanor, it should be Rackham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I think most of the fandom was with you on that. Uh, yeah, I think that's <laughs> yeah. something like that is what but we it, expected. But sure. it was really, same... really funny because <laughs> there was this, it sounds really ridiculous, but this is the kind of goofball stuff that we had behind the scenes. There was one of the makeup artists who had this really silly cape, you know, like when they're doing your hair. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. The cape was like this blonde woman with her hair like being blown completely to the side, like kind of Charlie Brown kind of <laughs> style. Uh-huh. And the and the hairdresser who had this, who had this hair dryer, was like, he looked exactly like Jack Rackham. And so I was like, this is the, this is how she dies, like hair dryer, <laughs> dry to the, <laughs> just dry her out, Rackham, just dry her out. <laughs> but yeah, it was just, it was just so like funny for us, you know, to get together over a few drinks and mm-hmm. and imagine the kind of the fantasies that Rackham would have played out in his mind, of his course. sick sure. little mind. <laughs> right, and you know he was having them. <laughs> yeah and it's so funny because it was like in that particular scene where she, where he says well my only solution is to to kill one of the two yes mm-hmm. and there's there's just this moment of like if you were ever gonna fucking do it do it now like, <laughs> and she just looks at him like come off it jack like <laughs> do you know what i mean yes, yes. we know exactly what I you mean it. i love i love that so much and I wish I wish I could have fucking ad libbed that line. Maybe that should yeah, have been oh my one ad lib. Come off it, I love that so much. Well, you got to do it now, so at yeah, least our exactly. listeners get to hear that. That's oh, exactly would... what was going on in my mind. Right. Oh, I would just yes, I would actually really have gotten so much joy out of Eleanor in that moment. Just we calling just, we Jack kind of shit. It. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that would be the perfect bookend to like when that time when he came into the tent with Eleanor and Vane and he's just like oh mm. shit yes <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that <laughs> oh my god that would have been perfect <laughs> oh god <laughs> it's, just, it's so hard not to corpse like when he's doing it just to, like so many times he just I can't even imagine and me, and, me and Zach were just like <laughs> like can't go again of course. oh jesus oh yeah. my 
Great. Goodness. Brilliant. Yes. I can, well, I can't imagine. I mean, we've, we have actually, of, of all of you all, the person that we've actually managed to spend some not official time with is Toby. And yeah, I can't Aww. even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, can't I mean, imagine. Seriously, like he is the only piece of light relief in this whole show. Jesus, do we need it? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We talked about that. I, I don't think it made it into the episode that we had of the interview with him, but we talked about no, how it did. Important... it did. It did. Okay. Mm-hmm. How important the yep. brevity that, that uh, Jack Rackham gave us was in a show that's so dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it gives you just a second to catch your breath. Goodness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, Silver has his slightly comic moments. I mean, they're never me- mm. they're never meant to be comic, but they come out. Com- That's I mean, yeah, right. yeah. No, they These are meant are, to be comic. Not quite as right. effortless as Jack right. Rackham's. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah and, totally but true. there's something really beautiful about this kind of dorky Silver in season yes. one, who's oh like trying God. to be Love trying it. to be a bit of a lad, and yeah. I just remember that scene where he's tied to the sofa in Ellen's yep. office. Yes. That's fabulous that episode. Just, oh, just brilliant! Just so much fun to play, <laughs> and like, and the whole time of just looking at Luke in this corner tied to this sofa, <laughs> I could never look at that sofa in the same way ever again. Oh, I imagine not. <laughs> And you had you had Randall there as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Randall, poor thing, with his legs stuck through. I mean, that sofa got ruined because obviously we had to we had to stick his leg in it. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, I didn't think about that. Right. The mechanics of dealing with legs. Sure, of course. <laughs> Non-existent legs. Yeah. I'm sure Luke spoke to you me. about yeah, yes. I think Luke, No, Luke you know what we had we did that. not talk to Luke about the leg thing. I actually in season four I feel like I'm spending a lot of time I shouldn't say this because now all <laughs> the listeners limbs. are gonna Yeah, just like where what are they doing with his leg exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. To me, like it blew my mind when I saw him on a blinking horse. Right. With like with with his right? uh, metal <laughs> leg pole. And I was just yeah. like, how the hell do you do that? Yeah, you know. That was, so that was yeah, that was, yeah. We 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 talked a lot <laughs> about that. We were impressed. <laughs> yeah, should probably give a shout out to um, our physios in South Africa who saved Luke's bacon this season, last season, because he was in so much pain. He oh, talked to us. Pain. That he talked to us mm. about about being mm. in so yeah, much that pain. He was still in recovery months later. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god! I mean, he he looks it. Mm, he does. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he is. He is. He's an. He's an okay actor and all, but you know, but he, <laughs> he, looks... he goes there with the pain and the suffering. Like he yeah. did the same. He did the same with the uh, with the storm and yeah. then doing the kind of yes. all of them stopped eating for a while, which was very interesting on set. They were so freaking well. grumpy. And oh, like... I bet. Oh no. <laughs> All of us, all of us, a bunch of hangry all of us, pirates. All of us were just like, "Oh bloody hell! Just eat a boiled egg for goodness' sake!" It's something like it's driving us nuts. Stop bitching at me, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think Toby Stevens, like he he went for it for a while, and then he was like, "I cannot function. I can't. Yeah, I can't do it." Yeah, because his yeah. like hit for him, the role was just relentless. Like. Oh yeah. It's amazing yeah. what he's done. Like and, and yes. that's really for me, I come away from this going, Jesus, I've seen someone at the pinnacle of their game. Yeah. Like, yes. Just yes, you have push through in a way that, you know, in such a stoic, amazing way. Yeah, he had a few moans here and there, but he's incredibly, incredibly focused. And I think that that sets the bar for everyone. Yeah. When you have a lead who who's like that everybody behaves in ways mm. that everyone brings their A game. Yes. Mm-hmm. Cause they're all going to stare into Flint. That's what, that's what Luke called yes. it. <laughs> and you definitely don't yeah. bitch and moan in front of him really? because uh, he will be able to like totally gazump you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> three months. Yeah. <laughs> that's excellent i Bless. love it so wait so i have a question about eleanor and her lovers mm-hmm. yeah so we had this whole thing i said earlier about about liz talking about people seeing eleanor um mm-hmm. and in general about you know whether romantic partners or partners i mean it's it's so confusing in black sales because the yeah rom- sure. all the, the romantic pairings are so non-traditional in the most beautiful way mm-hmm. um 
Do you feel like any of Eleanor's lovers like saw her, like really got her? Mm. I think I personally, just from the fact that I, I think that Max saw her because Max was then able to emulate her mm-hmm. in um, ways that were productive mm-hmm. and wow. in ways that, and I think that, uh, that beautiful scene where we're stood on the bridge between the brothel and the, oh and the, yes. and the tavern. <laughs> yes. That's genius. Scene. Genius. That's just sweet. even just the setting of it where they're kind mm-hmm. of meeting on this bridge between their two oh businesses, God. like phenomenal. Um, and Jessica just has this ability to play scenes in such a stoic, calm, beautiful way and give mm-hmm. the information that she's been processing, like that Max has been mulling over for yeah. years. And oh, the emotions like all underneath, the emotions all there, but it's yeah. so deep down. Yeah, and it's just it's it's so simple and it's so powerful, and and you know she says to her to her face, you know that you've taught me so much. Yes. Yeah. Oh God, but all the wrong lessons in so many ways. Yeah, in so <sighs> many ways, in so many ways. But I think it, what you do see in season four is Max mm-hmm. starting to teach her though, teach Eleanor those yep. lessons back to her. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Right, which is, it's almost like it's almost like Max took the lessons mm. and integrated them with her own brilliance, and then his and then is passing them back. Yeah, Eleanor. but Max has a much better capacity for right. self analysis, I Absolutely think, than does. Eleanor does. Yeah, and so uh, at the the kind of critic, I think Max is actually quite hard on herself in mm-hmm. a weird way, like. Yeah. As much as she she has that kind of vulnerability where you see in moments her go, oh, God, I fucking hate what I fucking just did. And yes, like, <laughs> yes. Yep. And she Absolutely. does it in this kind of very subtle way. And I think mm-hmm. that Eleanor doesn't have that at all. She never doubts herself. She right. has this thing where mm-hmm. she's just, this is what I had to do. And she doesn't go back and analyze herself right. in the same way. Or apologize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or apologize. Yeah, she has this mm-hmm. kind of narcissistic trait where she is, Enable, unable to admit her faults, which is a really interesting thing to play because it comes across as like this hard lack of humanity. But what it is is her struggling with this abandonment, struggling with this trauma, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just going, "Yep, yeah, that was the latest shit thing that just happened." Um, let's mm-hmm. let's what what's the next one? Bring it on! Bring yes. it on! Bring it on! Bring it on! Bring it on! <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's what she yeah. thrives off. So the fact that she doesn't, she's one of these people just that looks forward, doesn't look back, looks forward, doesn't look back, mm-hmm. looks forward, doesn't look back until there are significant moments that take her outside of herself. Right. And, and the pregnancy is obviously the biggest one. Yes. Right. Uh, so even though she's looked, she, I think the first one was that she looked death in the face in London. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think she ever had any any remorse for what she did. I think that was the thing. She was like, I was a pirate queen because I had to be a fucking pirate queen. <laughs> that was my world. Mm-hmm. That was where I was born. Right. You know, all of you guys who think that, you know, you can claim taxes off the colonies when you give us fuck all, you know? <laughs> right. Like right. all of that played into it. The suffering that, that she'd been through in life to sustain a life of, for society people in Whitehall, like that was the, you know, pinnacle of what she hated. Yes. So to then be saved by someone from within that world mm. was a, it was a very revealing moment. So those are the two moments where she is able to analyze what she is and who, and, 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 and what she's done. And I yeah. suppose in some ways coming back to the Island was almost like trying to make amends for that in a little way. Mm-hmm. But the bigger picture was my vision's still there. I can still make this a functioning island. I can still have this opportunity, like grab this opportunity. So when you look at the Max Eleanor relationship, what you realize is that Max is the only person who really gives her that kind of honest feedback. Mm-hmm. And sure. and I think Vane does it, but it's much harder for Eleanor to hear it from Vane because he's done so many things things that are kind of, you know, to to damage her. 
Liz and I have both said this before. Like, there's a lot of time where where we felt like Vane was telling Eleanor who she was, and it was more yeah. based on what he wanted her to be yeah. than what. And it was based in stuff that probably was her, but that he kind of extrapolated who she was to like this basically female version of himself. Like we felt right. like a lot of time right. Vane spent a lot of time, even though mm. he's a n- very noble character in a lot of ways, but with Eleanor, he spent a lot of time telling her sh- who she was rather than listening to who she was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that in so many ways. And I think that was the main frustration for her <laughs> because she knew she had this sexual weakness for him. Mm -hmm. that goes back a long, long way. So she was very aware of the fact that she always went back to that place, even though she knows it's damaging for her. Mm -hmm. Like she knows that it's like totally contrary to to everything she's fighting for. So uh, for me, it's it's that kind of, the difference is that, you know, Max showed her a kind of unconditional love that was very... Heart, like she didn't want to hear what Max had to say in that first scene no. of this Sam's never going to love you back. Right. Yes. You know, that's mm-hmm. that is a, a critical line for the whole entire show. Yes, it is. Yes, yes it is. And, right. you know, I think she doesn't, Eleanor can't listen to Vane because she knows her own weakness with it. With Max, mm-hmm. I think it's different in that they have this deep sexual connection, but she knows that Max acts in ways for her own survival, not just to try and control Eleanor. She never has tried to control Eleanor. She loves yeah. her on an equal uh, in an equal way. Yes, you know, sure. there's an equality uh-huh. in that relationship that didn't exist in the vain, uh, a vain um, Eleanor relationship. But there is a purity in the passion that she feels for for Vane. I think mm-hmm. that sure. I like that. That is very much about, you know, the, the guys, John and Dan, have always described it as Vane being this kind of bad college boyfriend. And <laughs> Oh, I and totally I – think- oh, see, now I need to – I gave you shit for that at, at New York Comic Con. <laughs> <laughs> So really, I was giving shit to the wrong person. I did. I totally did. I was like, who exactly was the bad, the bad partner, (laughs) the bad college partner? (laughs) I mean, she's just as bad. Now I know who I need to give shit to. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) But I think it's a, I think it's a very key point is that the, the, there were lots of things about the relationship with Vane that taught her to be a fighter, that taught her to Mm -hmm. be, and, and that they have this, um, this conflict, constant conflict, which was kind of reaffirming both of them as warriors, you know? Sure. Yes. Right. And well, like even when they were actually, we, we talked about this, how they were literally jockeying for position during sex. Mm. Right. Yeah. That was, right. Yeah. Right. It was always yes. a power play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, all of those scenes were about, um, and it's really interesting actually, because, because, you know, Zach and I talked a lot about those scenes and, and, I think that the way sex has been dealt with in this show is incredibly interesting because yes. we had a very specific process approaching it because the writers were so concerned that it didn't want to just seem gratuitous and that it was just quota to, to, to have these sure. every single, it was like when we were choreographing it, every single little move had a meaning. Right. And I think, hmm. you know, not to get too graphic, but <laughs> yeah, <go laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's all right. Everyone's watched the show. Oh, they've, they've seen you do these fine. things. <laughs> this podcast is fine. And, you know, no one's going to listen to it with their kids in the back of the car, hopefully. No, um, no they will not. Uh, no, like they don't show their children the show, they will not. Hopefully. We have an explicit tag. You're good. <laughs> yeah, you're good. good. Okay. But, you know, just tiny little details about how she makes sure that her pleasure is a priority. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. if you watch it carefully, there are little in, little instances which are in there, which I feel as a woman and as, you know, that it's really important that that's in there. And I think yeah. that's also, yes. I think that's something that Max has taught her. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, that's I like that. really interesting. I like that very yeah. much. Right. And that makes a lot of sense with Max because we mm. know, we learn mm. Max's connection with the body and yeah. capabilities. And Max's yeah. connection with her own pleasure Mm-hmm. I think was something, I mean, even the little brief scenes where she's comforting Eleanor 
Mm -hmm. through sex and Mm -hmm. I think that that's and Eleanor's kind of resisting because she's in this in this headspace where she's so angry and hurt right but what she's teaching what she's teaching Eleanor is this connect deep connect human connection and the comfort that can come out of a relationship where somebody is so giving Mm -hmm. and that is what Max does for Eleanor she gives 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 and you see it in those little moments well, she's prepared to give up everything for Eleanor, and Eleanor can't do it. She right, just can't do it. The vain uh, Eleanor relationship, sexually, is where Eleanor knows that she can take. Mm-hmm. You know, Eleanor knows huh. because he does. He does too, and there's an equality right. in that. There is. Yeah, we talked with Zach about that, actually. Like, what we were talking about when he punches Eleanor in the face. <laughs> He's like, if I'm going to punch her in the face, it's going to be about equality. Because, like, I see her as someone who is a force to be reckoned with. So, mm. yeah, that was really interesting. And and you see that in the sex, too, with them. Like, he does. Yeah. He mm-hmm. sees Eleanor as his equal, as his match. Yeah. And I can see where that's appealing to Eleanor, too, for someone who's yeah. fighting yeah. every second to be taken seriously. And I think also um, the fact that Max gives so much in the relationship and is prepared to give up everything Uh was kind of terrifying to Eleanor. Right. Yeah. Because no one has ever done that for her. Right. Mm -hmm. She doesn't trust it. It's a lot of pressure. Yes. Right. Yeah. She doesn't trust it. Whereas with Bane, she can can trust to take, you know, she can Mm trust. There's this, there's this thing of like, he's never going to abandon me because we have this kind of this, sexual connection where we can't let it go you know yeah sure addicted mm-hmm. mm, there, there is a kind of addictive see this all, right this all just makes me so sad for eleanor <laughs> yeah. I, know, right? I have never loved eleanor so much hannah <laughs> <laughs> no but it's so true i mean all of it is so true and so evident in the show and it, right the the person in me who is you know almost the opposite of eleanor in so many ways like Obviously, there wouldn't be a great story or a television show for us to watch had Eleanor just, you know, run off with Max. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But, you know, it was like, what is it? Episode two. And I'm just like, I'm like, I already can tell how damaged you are. Just go, go with her. Just, just yeah, go yeah, do yeah. that thing. Yeah. <laughs> just... And all of these, these scenes as well where, where Eleanor and Max are like, you know, talking about their next move or berating each other mm-hmm. for things mm-hmm. they've done or... You know, oh, God. to me, there was also a moment like there was always this moment like Jess and I would would joke and be like, maybe at the end of the scene we should just add live and they go, fuck all of this, fuck it, let's just run. <laughs> <laughs> part of me was always rooting for that option. It's, yeah, I just, yeah, I was just like Eleanor and Max, you, just, just like go, just you, you're both yeah. really smart and resourceful. You would figure it out. It's true. You could find a lovely little desert island somewhere, right? Totally. You guys, any means of it, and, yes. and run it like you, like yeah. Max and Eleanor. If they showed up anywhere, yeah. they would be running that place within a week. Yeah, without all the other pirates <laughs> fucking it all up for them, you know? Exactly. So many goddamned men. Too many so goddamn many, men in here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. God. Oh my god, that scene. I mean, it's. I feel like we're way too much talking about season four, but oh my god, Hannah. <laughs> it's so good. It's, it's so, so think, brilliant, you know, it? We've both been pretty mm-hmm. clear about this on Twitter, but like, oh my God. Oh, those, thank all you. of your scenes yeah. in season four. Yeah. Just, Eleanor really comes into her own. Yeah. Yeah. Eleanor. It's kind of funny, like, you know, to know that your character's dying, but to be so happy sure. that your character mm-hmm. is going to get all of those opportunities yes. before her death. You well, know, yeah. and it's, it's, right. it's that thing of like, uh, it's, it's interesting because. I was thinking about it in relation to this whole thing of like, mm, the audience aren't going to be necessarily satisfied that it's not a revenge death, as you said at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And as we said, it's it's way a way more intelligent, way option. more, mi- way of more course. meaningful option. Yeah, sure. because you you would look back on this character in a way where the post mortem of who she was would just be like, Jesus, thank God that bitch is dead. You know, right. and yeah, I was absolutely. You're right. It would have cheapened her entire character over all of mm-hmm. the season. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. it would. And it, she, all she would have served as was was an antagonist to the mm-hmm. to the pirates' progress yeah. and to the and particular so pirate satisfying. crew. Mm. I mean, she yeah. is an antagonist. She definitely is, sure. as mm-hmm. as something that, that is quite often the case that um, you know women are antagonists in the story because there's right. 
most of the time they're the voice of reason. Right. <laughs> ah. Exactly. And look at it. Look at it now with Maddie. Right. Like, holy, and that's what's really beautiful about the scenes with Maddie, uh, and the fact scenes. that they're together. That moment where she's crawling towards her in the house is like, I think, oh, I think there is this me. moment of like she's the only one who could who can survive and and she's got to live you know i know right. i think at that point eleanor knows she's dying she knows right. she yeah. knows these are her last moments but yeah. when she sees the way maddie can handle the pirates you know and right. the, and the, the way maddie sure. handles herself and the way maddie handles herself with eleanor like yeah. she sees why they were best mates as kids cuz they mm-hmm. had the uh-huh. same fire in their belly Yep. Ah, that's good. And it's it's great. It's just and and Zeti plays it in, in also in this very stoic way, but she is the voice of reason that had the love of a mother. Mm-hmm. Yes. Exactly. And it makes such a difference. Oh God. So yeah, she's been able to to cultivate this humanity in a way that Eleanor never could. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's there's a beautiful line actually, which I think is so ironic because in the scene where um where Eleanor comes in to talk to Vane and, and, you know, she says to him, you, you are all that lacks a mother's love. Yep. I know. We talked about that. The and irony I'm like, of, that, sure of that line. I read it. I read it. I was like, uh, Eleanor, um, can you just listen to yourself for a second here? Oh, my God. But I, I just love thought it. it was so great that they put those lines yep. in her mouth. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because she could be talking about herself. Well, she should know what it's like to lack a mother's love. Right. She knows what right. it's like, and and I think that's another thing from the from the Vane and Eleanor backstory of why they understand each other. Absolutely, yes. absolutely, I would agree. right? Because they've right. also been they've both been abandoned in ways that I mean, Max has been abandoned. I mean, Max's oh, backstory God. is just so I know. horrific, so so heartbreaking. But I think that that's where you realise the humanity in Max and the way she's been mm-hmm. able to survive that without. And still be able to love people. Right. Still mm-hmm. be able to give. She's just one yeah. of these people who, who in some ways is a kind of masochist because she'll give, give, give until right. it kind of destroys Absolutely. herself. But Absolutely. she has this ability to be maternal and giving right. and to people and, and then giving to her lovers in a way that is just so beautiful and so self-effacing. And, and, and she doesn't, mm-hmm. I mean, in some ways, I'm like, Max, I wish you had a bit more self-esteem. Like, come on, <laughs> like, you know, be that hard person, which is who right. she's starting to be. And, and, you know, you start to see as her success grows, her yeah. cultivate all of those elements of, of herself. So, yeah, I think um, I think that each individual backstory of Eleanor's lovers tell you a little bit about her loss and tell you about her inability to... Mm, yes. Certainly. To be humane. And then, because they're always, there's similarities and contrasts in every single one. Mm-hmm. And I think what you see in the the rogers Eleanor relationship is her attempting to create this idealized perfect relationship. Mm-hmm. Which I think is kind of interesting because marriage in so many ways is about two people attempting to be the best version of themselves for this other person yes and we fail at it and struggle and but there is something about that moment of of committing to that that says this is what I'm striving for and I know I'm not always going to get it right but let's just let's commit to that and go for it Mm -hmm. and I think that 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 I think that that's what she's she's loving the ideal version of a, of a marriage and, and what that could offer her within the society that she lives in. You know, mm-hmm. she's, she, what's really, really interesting is that she can be a completely different person in Nassau because she's not bound by the societal norms of London or, right. sure. or of any, any place where women were only defined by their marriage. Mm-hmm. So, that's why she can have the success she has where she is, you know? So the fact that, that she comes back to the island and tries to fit into the societal norm mm-hmm. or tries to see ways in which she can wield power from within 
the rules of society. She's becoming this kind of, you know, in, it was it was interesting actually because uh, when they told me that when I had this massive thing of like she has to be a star away, I want to shake my head. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we really, we really need you to be in that other story sometime. Yeah. Like, can, you, can you do? Can you do that I version of like of like Hannah playing the badass <laughs> right. with like the shaved head and all of that? I would really enjoy that. We could at least ask a Schmitzy to do another comic of it, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I know. Oh my I god! Know. I guess, like, okay. Schmitz, I've got the next idea. Um, he will listen to this. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. He better do, Toby. We need Make it so. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Toby, the three of us are asking you to make it so. So really, yeah. how could you resist? I think it should be like, I think it should be like a choose your own adventure type bit. Of like... <laughs> I love that. Choose, the choose your own like Eleanor Guthrie. Romance. Choose your own <laughs> Eleanor Guthrie adventure. It's like the adventure time. Yeah, I like this very much. Oh, yeah, I, I was so addicted to those that. as a kid. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Um, oh, wait, wait, Hannah, can I just say first quickly, yeah. my daughter's 10, so she's not uh-huh. watched Black Sales. You're her favorite. Oh, I just showed her stills. Oh, bless. Oh, I know it's really funny because my niece is 10 as well. Oh. And my niece is always just like, when am I going to get to see you on the telly? I think she's. <laughs> sure. I think, I, think, uh, I think she watched. Um, little bits of Maleficent she's but she's like she's wonderful because she's an avid reader Mm -hmm. and so she's she really gets into story and narrative but she can't really handle watching violent stuff or oh my god that's like my daughter that's totally my daughter yeah Uh i think it's because of reading so much that she's kind of developed this uh, you know imaginary world Mm -hmm. or ability to create images in her in her head and go off on storylines but um my sister, I think she tried to watch a bit of Maleficent, and my mm-hmm. sister was like, "It's just too violent." Like, yeah, she just, my daughter couldn't do it yeah. either yet. Yeah, just yet. I mean, I know she will at some point, but it is that thing of like for kids. Like, I think my my nephew saw some picture of me. Co- I think it was because um, I had some family on sets when they came mm-hmm. when I was doing the. Desk. My my nephew saw some picture of me goofballing around with loads of blood on me. And uh, he was like, <laughs> he just went, Auntie Hannah, why have you got ketchup all over you? And I just thought, that's brilliant. <laughs> I was like, I was like, you know, just in case I get a bag of chips, I can just like oh. wipe it off my arm. <laughs> you're, you're all set. <laughs> No, my daughter knows everyone like like she I was reading um, Lauren's article her Mm -hmm. interview with you. And so my daughter, she's like, "Okay, well, that's the guy that you went out for drinks. And that's my favorite. (laughs) And (laughs) she's connecting all the dots. She doesn't know the character names necessarily, but she knows she's like, that's the guy you like, even though he does really bad things. But he's your favorite character. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They can see they can see it when you're like totally sold on something. They're like, Ew. yeah, well, Absolutely. oh no, my daughter, <laughs> my daughter gives me pirate everything at this point. Oh, yep. brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm like. Okay. Geez, guys, you're not watching this until you're at least 42. I know. That's why I tell my daughter. <laughs> I know. Like in 20 I know. years when you're watching right. Black Sales, <laughs> they'll be like, this is an old hat. Everybody does this. Yeah, but they did it first. They yeah. led the charge. You don't even know. <laughs> they changed the face of television it's history. So true. Exactly. It's so true. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What, a, what a wonderful, yeah. I know, Liz and I keep doing this in, tr- in interviews. We're just like so happy for you all that you got to be part of this amazing story. We really are, yeah. Which is just I like mean, a silly thing for us to say. But it's a yeah. real strange sense of pride. I'm like, yes. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's, you did it, the thing. But it only makes it worth it when there are people who like pick up on all those details and make it yeah. and, and like realize all of it. This for me is has been an incredible process over the last couple of days. It's just of like of kind of realizing how impactful certain aspects of the story are for people. And like, I mean, you do it for that reason, but like Mm -hmm. it just, it just is so incredibly moving when people have those interpretations of it. And then to be part of that and know that you're getting good material and know that you're working with the best of the best of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Like, and then 
to see it reflected back is just it's it's mind blowing. Like it really is. I'm welling up. Don't get well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's it is evident though the thoughtfulness that is put into all of the characters by all mm. of the actors has come oh, across because yeah. it is brilliant writing, of course, but without the nuance and the subtlety that is added by the complete embodiment and investiture in these roles that has been mm. done by the cast, we would we we could have lost it so easily. It could have yeah. become that pirate show so yeah. easily, and it's transcended that just God just mm-hmm. so beautifully, mm-hmm. and and become art i mean it's it's yeah, um, it truly high is. art and we're, we're god we're Aww. very honored to be able Aww. to do what we do and talk to you all about it and about the mm-hmm. the craft and the care that you put into it because Aww. it is evident to anyone who is really watching and listening it's evident yeah. yeah and it's and it's really interesting actually going back to like season one and watching it again and uh-huh, i've not right? actually watched right. I have not actually watched the whole season and I've not binge watched it, but I just went back to kind of look at a couple of other things where I just, I just wanted to consolidate how, what made it into the edit basically. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because yeah. actually I, I'm sure i hope John doesn't have a go at me for saying this, but most episodes, <laughs> most episodes came through running way over the 55, 56 minute. Oh, um, sure. So there were always bits that got cut out. Sure. So it was kind of quite hard sometimes to know if you could play a certain thing because you weren't sure if it was even right. relevant anymore. Right. Um, but the show was really finding its feet in season one. And there were so many details and so many things about characters that we were working on and finding. And, and, and we had that prep time, which was amazing because a lot of shows don't get that. Um, and we we had um, all of those little details. It was just about letting them come through in an organic way yes. at the right time. And I think that, first of all, we have to thank stars in, in a major way because they gave, up, they gave us the pacing right. of that story mm-hmm. in a way. Because a lot of shows are like, no, you need to have, you know, the big event happen here, the big event. Right. And I think... Or you need to establish the character in that backstory because yes. otherwise no one's going to feel for them right now. And it's like, no, the payoff is worth so much more if Amen. people are kept in the dark for, for a long time and they have it to pick up on clues. You know, yeah. to be a detective when you're watching the show is the best feeling. Oh, like, I, so I love it. So much fun. So much fun. Yeah. So I just, I just think that um, we we have to be really, really thankful for – the audience that have stuck with it and, and, and are getting the payoff now. Like I kept mm-hmm. saying this when we were in, in Comic-Con and in, in New York and saying, guys, there's, there's some serious payoffs for you. Like <laughs> <laughs> this is all for you guys. Yeah, like, right. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. to, in this current climate of TV and how much it's being produced and how competitive it is right now, to be on a show that has that kind of slow burn effect is yes. just amazing because I think a lot of other shows are trying to make an impact in mm-hmm. season one and two and perhaps mm-hmm. they do it, but then they, but then they the storyline has fizzled out right. Right. and then they're just Absolutely. without, without any of these characters really having their full arcs or the story really having any meaning and how, how, like if you're reading a novel and it just, Right. Finishes like right. that. Like you're like, exactly. Jesus, I've invested a lot of time for nothing. Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. So I think I think there was a incredible respect paid to our fan base in that mm-hmm. way. Yes. But I making the decision great. also just to end it at four, I think was a very yes. brave and brilliant mm-hmm. decision as well. I yeah, completely it's, agree. It's yeah. shaping up so beautifully. I mean, I never doubted it. I mean, when I met you, I guess I had podcasted up to season two and something and mm-hmm. you know obviously watched through season three multiple times but um I feel like yeah season four is giving us the promise of what the first three seasons had made clear would be there and mm-hmm. yeah and it's, it is it's such an amazing thing to have a story that is a story and has a shape mm-hmm. and the shape is so intricate and so beautiful yes. and has so many aspects that you can discover over time and multiple watches 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure the creators have probably like talked to you about it with regards to that we were shooting season two before season one aired. And, yes. And you know, yeah. So there was something really, really beautiful about working in isolation like that mm. because we didn't have to uh, think too much about what other people thought. Right. Mm-hmm. And allow yourself to be part of this but part of this journey, a part of the storyline in a way that wasn't not the audience, you know, audience reaction isn't important. It's really important. Mm-hmm. But I no, think that there's sure. also there's also a danger in that kind of we live in this world of immediate satisfaction and people mm-hmm. want the payoffs yes. and stuff right now. And it's like mm-hmm. hmm, the best stories in literature, the best stories in film, the best stories in yeah. TV yes. aren't the ones that give you the payoff straight away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Extremely lucky. I feel extremely blessed. <laughs> such a beautiful story, and you got to play such a beautiful character. It's thank amazing. you. Well, thank you so much, Hannah, for joining us tonight. Uh, for giving us your insight, you're so captivating and lovely and thoughtful. And I think it was Lauren Sarna who told us, like, your favorite Black Sales actor is going to be the one that you talked to last, and she's. Totally. Oh. <laughs> as soon as we totally talked something new, we're like, no, you're my new favorite. So move over, Tom Hopper. There's a new cinnamon roll in town. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start a bit of competition now. Now you've said that Toby Stevens is gonna be like, I need to be on the show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but thank you guys for your support over the seasons, and it's just it's just brilliant to have people that you can natter away with about all these like little geeky things that I'm trying to get in there. We might be the biggest pirate geeks of all, except for the cast. Being a pirate geek, cool. Yeah. It is super cool. Thank you so much, Hannah. Well, until next time, then from Common Room Radio, I am Liz Stevens, and I'm Daphne Olive, and I'm Hannah New. <laughs> yeah, you are. Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. I think I called that the gate of a betrayal. And then that's what I called it. Betrayal. It's yeah. Eleanor, Ga- Eleanor Gate. Yeah. Eleanor <laughs> Gate. <laughs> okay, that's, that's going to be our outtake, oh, if you don't mind. Brilliant. 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 <laughs> that should be a new hashtag. Hashtag I know, seriously. Eleanor Gate. <laughs> it will be now.